Well, let's uh, let's get started. We got an awesome topic to talk about tonight. Uh, Cole Funsa is a uh, engine, electrical engineer from he got his degree, I believe, from the University of Minnesota, and uh, he's been with uh, Great River Energy now for about eight years or a little over. And he's the manager of generation engineering in their power supply division. And he's been kind enough to take time tonight to share with us this fantastic new technology that they're working on uh, for, I guess I would say, extended storage type batteries. So, Cole, uh, please take it from here. Thanks, Doug. Uh, appreciate all of you having me. Uh, excited to talk about our project. Um, there's a couple notes. We, we have given this presentation at some other conferences like MIPSICON and uh, some other areas. So if, if, if you've seen this before, I apologize if it's a repeat, but uh, we're, we're getting our mileage out of this slide deck. So we're keeping it going. But um, yeah, my name is Cole Fonseth. I'm with Great River Energy. And uh, Doug had reached out and asked me to, to touch on our project that we're working on with Form Energy. Uh, it's a, a multi-day storage project up at our Cambridge facility here in Minnesota. Um, so I'm just planning to talk a little bit about our company, a little bit about Form Energy and their and their technology, and then uh, some information on the project. So uh, I'd be happy to take questions uh, at, at the end of the presentation if there are any. Um, otherwise, uh, if there's questions afterwards, by all means, uh, you know, please reach out to Doug and he can get us connected and we can take it from there. So. Um, for those who don't know of Great River Energy, uh, we're a, a generation and transmission cooperative uh, based out of Maple Grove, Minnesota. Um, we have 27 member owners throughout the state, as you can see on the right side. So we predominantly serve most of the, the rural communities here in the state, um, about 1.7 million people. Uh, at the company here, we're about 550 employees. We have nine power plants and I think a little over 5,000 miles of transmission. So. I put a picture up there. If you ever drive on four nine, or I'm sorry, six ninety four up on the north part of the metro, um, you probably see the wind turbine spinning. That that's our headquarters. So, um, a little bit about us. It, it we're we're a little unique versus some other utilities you might be familiar with, but we're we're a not for profit cooperative. So we're we're owned by our members. Um, you know, we don't have investors. We're we're not a for profit company. So. We have different goals and metrics that we're working towards. Um, I, I put some notes in here that, you know, the, the members you see on the screen here, they, they have ultimate authority to govern us. Um, uh, and our board is made up of our member owners. So um, really, we operate and everything we do is on behalf of our members um, and for their benefit. So it's a, it's a really cool place to work. Uh, it's a really unique opportunity, and it's a it's it's a treat because you get to work on cool projects like this sometimes. Um, so, not much else to report on that. Um, Doug had asked me to touch on our our headquarters a little bit. You know, when we look about sustainable design or renewables uh, technology, uh, GRE's always had that kind of at the forefront of our minds when we think about our portfolio and what our members want. Um, you know, I talked about our headquarters here in Maple Grove. Uh, it's a lead platinum building, something we're very proud of. Uh, we, we love to show it off. If someone ever wants a tour, by all means, uh, we love giving tours. And another big feature of our, our facility here is uh, it was sort of a test bed for us to test out a couple of renewable technologies, specifically solar and wind. So we have just over 500 kilowatts of renewable energy that feeds our build, building load. And uh, it, it's sort of fun to watch that offset a lot of our needs from our local distribution owner, which just so happens to be a member owner of ours. Um, some recent changes I put on the right is we, we are transitioning our system operations center to our headquarters. So um, it's really gonna be sort of the focal center point for, for GRE and our, and our members and our system. Uh, so that's a big project that was undertaken. It's, you know, state-of-the-art facility. I, on the left side there, you can see, I think it's a, a hundred foot wall by 40 feet tall uh, that they'll have a basically TV map board that they control our system on. So um, we're really excited to see that and uh, have a really cool spot for our operators to work out of. Um, you know, if you look at Great River Energy as, as a GNT, um, 
I wanted to touch on just some of the the span or what we have or what kind of makes up Great River Energy. So if you look at the pie charts on the left side, um, it's sort of a snapshot of our portfolio as of 2021. And you can see 57% is, you know, coal and uh, natural gas and other other aspects and resources. And recently we filed our IRP with the state uh, PUC uh, forecasting where we want to see ourselves. And if you look at just as close as 2027, you can see a lot of that shifts from uh, carbon-based resources to renewables um, and obviously market purchases from MISO. So we're, we're really on this path of decarbonization and renewable focus. And that plays into sort of the, the technology that we're looking at here with Form Energy. Um, I put a note from our IRP that we anticipate about three and a half percent of our nameplate capacity to actually be provided by storage uh, in the year 2037. So uh, we see a big need for storage in the horizon and we, we hope technology like Form Energy is a solution to that. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, we have uh, a very large footprint of transmission in our system, um, over 100 substations, 5,100 miles of transmission line, and a big effort that we're doing, not just in power supply, but in transmission to help us integrate intermittent resources and renewables is the Northland Reliability Project. Um, I'm not going to get into it too much of it here, but a big transmission build out in the MISO region um, as a part of the LRTP effort to uh, try to get, you know, renewables and that out to areas that might not be uh, dense in wind and solar. So um, again, just sort of a snapshot of our portfolios and where we're, we're moving as we go into the future. Um, Doug had asked me, again, I, I'm not sure with the, the composition of the group here, but uh, everything that we buy and sell into the system in terms of energy and capacity goes through MISO, the Mid-Continent in Independent System Operator. Um, again, I, I just want to touch on this because they're really looking at not just GRE as a utility, but all of the utilities that span this map that you can see on the right. And some of the challenges they say, you know, if you look at some of the extreme events that we have in the winter time, I, I put an excerpt out from uh, the 2021 Arctic event report that's available on their website, but there's more and more challenges coming up that we have to face in the utility industry from a reliability standpoint to ensure that as our grid becomes more based on intermittent resources, such as wind and solar, that um, we've got to come up with solutions to this. And I think that's a you know great stage or setup for what we're trying to accomplish with Form Energy and some of these other transmission projects and just trying to make sure that we keep um, energy reliable and, and cost effective as what MISO is ultimately responsible for, so. So that's GRE and what we do um, as a whole. Uh, a lot of these slides come from Form. They had developed these, so I'll do my best to represent them, but uh, this was ultimately the presentation they put together and, and presented, so uh, I'll do my best. Um, so Form Energy uh, is a relatively new company, but they are rapidly growing. You can see, I think this number on the left is probably over 500 now, if I had to guess. Um, and they have a couple locations throughout the country that they've been working out of, but um, they've, they've had a large amount of capital investment and uh, are made up of a lot of people that come from relative, or I should say related industries, uh, Tesla, energy storage companies, renewable companies. So they're, they're amassing uh, experience base at their company of a lot of people that come from the relative areas and are kind of pooling their uh, knowledge to, to move this technology forward. Um, you know, I've, I've highlighted or alluded to some of the challenges, but um, some things that Form identifies as an, a potential challenge that we're going to be facing in the future is the intermittency of resources, the carbon mandates, such as the one that's here in Minnesota that we have now, um, extreme weather events, and then uh, transmission congestion. So, again, a lot of the stuff that MISO has highlighted, um, Form is echoing that this is this is something that we hope that our, our our product might be able to address and that utilities can leverage us to address that. Um, you know, they, they put together some graphs and I think where they want to focus on this one is it's not just a regional issue. Um, when you look at events that occur, if it's cold weather, if it's a lack of resources available, um, 
it, it doesn't just last a couple minutes or a couple hours. Um, it, it, it can last a couple days. Uh, you know, you think about Winter Storm Elliot last winter, right around the holiday season, um, there's a couple really cold days in there and it's sustained, you know, it's not just one cold day, it's five cold days and uh, forms saying, you know, existing storage technology really focuses on that hour span where form wants to differentiate themselves is that they're a multi-day storage solution. So um, that that's a key differentiator that uh, they, they want and we want to address with this technology. So, and again, just focusing again on, on the weather impacts and these and these and these events that occur. If you look at Texas, um, you know, there was this huge shortage of generation. They ultimately had to drop load as a result, and it lasted for several days. And what form asserts is, you know, with the low cost storage option, there's the potential that had this been deployed, that would be a, a solution not just to rely on generation, but also storage to help offset some of these these really extreme events. Um, also going on with, with some of these, you know, we said intermittent events or, or uh, cold weather periods is uh, regulations around uh, carbon mandates. And uh, again, this slide's a little outdated. It says the standards proposed, but as we're aware that Minnesota has this um, passed in our legislature that uh, more and more states are just identifying the need to decarbonize. So form is very much focused on that and looking to partner this solution with uh, low carbon or zero carbon resources as being the way that you potentially, you know, recharge or um, supply these storage systems. So um, definitely leveraging and focusing on that. Um, and again, just looking at sort of the, the horizon, uh, a lot of states and utilities and just Companies in general are, are seeing a need for long duration storage um, as being the viable solution to, to solving a lot of these, these challenges. So uh, form brings us to the solution, which uh, they all say is there. So um, the underlying technology that is here on the form energy side is a, it's, it's an iron air uh, technology, iron air battery. Um, and it's, it's something that, you know, dates back to the 1960s, as you can see with, with NASA. Um, so it's it's not necessarily a new technology. It's been around for a while. Um, and you can see throughout the years, just these different uh, in investigations or uses that they were kind of looked at in the past. And then as we move towards 2020, Form Energy coming and saying, hey, we think we could use this as a this long duration uh, energy storage technology. So. Um, I really like this graph because I think a lot of the questions we get when these presentations come up or someone raises their hand is they say, well, why don't you do this or why don't you do that? And form, you know, they're they're aware that other technologies exist out there and they they look at sort of that dollar per energy, because that's really where we need storage is how much energy can we store and 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 release into the system. So um, the big differentiator, obviously, is the duration. You can see form energy is out to the 200 hours. Um, a lot of the other technologies where they are suited, like I had said, is in the, you know, couple hours to maybe up to 20 hours. Um, so, and then if you look at the cost, the installed cost per kilowatt hour, form is really, really aggressively targeting a, a very economical solution to this. So those are the, the key metrics that they're really working towards for their solution. Um, their, their work on this has been really interesting to experience. You know, we come from the uti utility industry where a lot of our technology, like transformers, breakers, things that have been around for decades, um, you know, forms working on something that is brand new and they're in the prototyping and design phase. So it's, it's been very interesting to watch them progress through it. And, you know, just in a couple short years, uh, going from, you know, coming out of MIT to having several projects announced with very large utilities across the country and um, a significant amount of capital investment in them. So it's it's really been a, a, a wild ride for the Form Energy team and just kind of GRE as being their partner uh, throughout all this. So um, again, looking at sort of the progression and evolution of their technology, uh, taking it from conceptual up to a commercial commercialized product 
um, really just sort of ramps up if you look at where they started to where they're going. You know, they have a picture of a plastic cup um, mm -hmm. with a piece of iron. And, you know, now we're getting up into the November of last year where we're looking at multi-module systems, you know, the large containers that contain basically a unit cell of what we would ultimately deploy. So um, really cool to watch them put this together, but then also be thinking about how do we commercially develop this that we can, you know, produce these in large quantity uh, to fulfill the need that they see in the future. So I, Doug mentioned, I'm an electrical engineer. So full disclosure, a lot of this is uh, chemistry and I, I didn't do so well at chemistry, but I'll do my best. Um, but the, the underlying, you know, not to oversimplify, but with the iron air battery, really what you're doing is rusting and unrusting a medium and the uh, electrons that are given off throughout those process changes are ultimately the, us charging and discharging the battery. Um, so again, with with iron just being a very prevalent resource here on Earth, um, it's it's really looking that they're trying to use products that are very low cost um, and allow them to to use that as a storage medium. So um, they put a couple of the metrics of of why they're looking at this, but if you take one thing away from an iron air battery is that it's the rusting and unrusting is what the charge and discharge cycles are. Um, again, talking a bit about it, you know, there's an aqueous electrolyte that is a part of it. And I really can't speak to much more than that. Um, if you have questions, I'll do my best, but um, the, the, the process as we can see during a discharge is um, the rusting of that, uh, uh, the iron pellets, as you can see, and then on the, on the contrary, as we would apply a voltage across that cell, uh, we start to have those ions transfer back and we would unrust it. So, um, it, you know, at, at its most basic form, it's a fairly easy concept to grasp, but much more is going on than just that behind the scenes. Um, some of the questions we've gotten from our members, we happen to be Minnesota where we have the iron range. And when we mentioned that we're using a storage product that uses iron, there's a lot of interest about, well, what kind of iron? I did not know there were different kinds of iron. This has been a learning exercise for me. But, uh, you know, if you think about what Minnesota produces is a lot of iron ore. Um, that's not necessarily what they're using in the form energy product. They're using what's called uh, DRI. Um, it's It's what they're using to create their anodes and um, ultimately it's a net benefit for the iron industry that they'd be using this technology. It's not necessarily something that would be coming out of a Minnesota mine, but it, it definitely benefits uh, industry in Minnesota in that aspect. So um, it's, it's definitely one of our members focus uh, and excitement around this is uh, especially up north in the iron range that uh, excited to see something that utilizes that as its technology. Um, another differentiator or something that uh, Form does like to point out is with this iron air technology, think about lithium ion batteries. I know with uh, local jurisdictions or when we look at uh, some of the inherent risks of other technologies is just be, based on the energy density, they, they can tend to be, or they can be volatile, um, potentially, you know, fires, explosions, that kind of thing. And what Form is looking at and what they're certifying against with the relative uh, standards associations is that they have a, you know, inherently safe product. Um, it does not short circuit like, uh, you know, something like a lithium ion battery would. Um, and it's really, you know, not made up of, of things that you wouldn't necessarily uh, be worried about. So um, again, I can't speak to too much of it, but uh, they're definitely trying to make sure that they can differentiate themselves, um, you know, away from things like heavy metals and, and, and volatile type reactions uh, from, from some other competitive, competitive competing technologies. So sp specifically with the product, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time here. I think I'm doing all right, but um, it's sort of built upon different layers of it. Um, what, I described as a cell as its most basic block. And you can see as you start to put a cell into a module and you bolt modules together in an enclosure and you deploy that as a block, um, what we're looking at for our pilot project would be sort of on that second to the right, the power block size, where we've got a number of containers that are made up of the modules and cells. 
and that's the scope and size of our pilot that that we're looking at here but um, form, you know, as they're looking at larger and larger installations and projects with other utilities are saying that it's basically you kind of just keep connecting them together. So they have this, you know, concept of a system that might be over 100 megawatts and gigawatts hours and energy density. So um, you start to get sort of an idea or a concept around um, what a, a, a large utility deployment installation might look like with this technology. Um, and again, if you look at the, the footprint and what they're looking at, um, the, the enclosures kind of butt up to each other. There's this concept that they're looking at of, of shared re shared uh, auxiliary systems. You know, they're really trying to make it a modular system that you can sort of plug and play, to, for lack of a better term. So um, as they design it, it's, it's re again, really interesting to watch that progression of their design um, and, and, and what it becomes as they think about, you know, what are the logistics of us installing, commissioning, expanding these systems? So again, from a conceptual standpoint, this is what they have in mind and are looking at. And again, just, you know, looking at a commercial launch, uh, some of the, some of the metrics that they're focusing on for their, for their installation are, you know, the, the power ratings, the energy densities, the durations on how long they discharge the system lifetimes and, and, you know, how much space and temperature and all the other considerations. So um, it's, it's what they're targeting for their commercial launch. It's things that we'll be evaluating against as a part of our pilot project and uh, um, something we're, we're really excited to, to vet out and hopefully uh, share those findings with our member systems and member owners and spread the, spread the knowledge well. So just sort of a, a zoom in on that, you know, overall, uh, I forget what they call it, the, you know, system deployment of what that would look like. So this is not Cambridge. This is some uh, uh, made up land that form has created. So, so moving on to our project, uh, Doug had asked before the, the uh, meeting had started, but uh, GRE's pilot with form will be the first project that form will have deployed at a commercial scale. Um, so the project is located at our Cambridge, Minnesota plant. Um, that plant uh, currently exists. We have uh, a couple of peaking gas turbines at the site. And uh, um, uh, it's actually within our, our member system, East Central Electric's footprint. So it seemed like a really good area for us. We had some extra space. Uh, you can see kind of in that middle bottom picture that we had a big grassy area and said, how about here? And form said, it looks perfect to us. So. Um, that that's where we're targeting uh, the first installation. The size that we're aiming at is 1.5 megawatts and 150 megawatt hours. So, you know, as you look at some of the other sizes, what we're talking about, hundreds of megawatts and gigawatt hours of energy. This is, you know, order of magnitude less than that. But for a pilot, again, it's something that allows us to to look at the technology, learn from the technology, and partner with Form as they learn. How they deploy their products and and as they gain experience with it too so um you know we're looking at the end of 2024 for this project to be uh in operation um and really excited there's a lot of excitement around uh as we kind of move in we're you know currently in the design phase working with contractors um early next year is it, it's going to get real and it's going to get fast so uh, a lot of excitement around that here at gre and at forum and then, you know, just we, we announced our project, um, boy, I think it was 2019, 2020, I think. Um, and it seems like, you know, following that, it's just been announcement after announcement with Form as they partner with other utilities across the country. Uh, Georgia Power um, announced a project that they're working on with Form uh, using their technology. XL Energy's announced several projects now. Um, so it, it's exciting to see a technology that GRE is piloting with form starting to get picked up by, you know, bigger and other utilities. So um, again, really excited to, to be a part of this and to learn from it and, uh, you know, as it progresses more and more. And then, you know, as form as a company, this doesn't, you know, GRE's plan, but forms, you know, their, their schedule moving out here into the future and what they're looking at is, um, 
you really want to start with that uh, pilot project scale here in the 2024 timeframe, and they're ramping up quick. Um, you know, 2025, 2026, I believe that's the time frame for some of the other projects at Excel and other utilities are looking at going into service. And you can see as we move into the late 2020s and 2030s, um, really starting to ramp up on the, you know, form, form is starting to ramp up on their deployment of the technology and, and storage products. So um, it'd be really fun to watch them grow and uh, um, just kind of take off. So um that was the end of uh what we had to share right now i guess the the last thing i'll say you know we we don't have any of these modules to really showcase or highlight yet like i said they're they're being developed and uh one thing i can recommend is that form energy does have a, a pretty active youtube channel um they are building their manufacturing facility in Weir weirton west virginia and uh they've been posting updates of that facility and that's where gre will be uh, receiving our first modules from. So we're eagerly awaiting the construction of that facility and then, um, you know, getting a chance to see those commercial commercial modules roll, roll off the line and, and head up here towards Minnesota. So if you have a chance, check it out. Otherwise, uh, if there's questions or any comments, I'd be happy to take them now. Cole, one of the people in chat asked for show that uh, uh, slide with the rust and unrust kind of again if you would please rust and unrust i can yeah. do that that's a that's a new tech terminology <laughs> uh was it this one or the uh, the i think it looks like it yeah. yeah that's the one thank you yeah no problem um i have a question um my name is chris I, I'm wondering, is, are there other, um, is, is this iron air battery technology, is it um, going to, or do you think it's it's supplanting or, or the lithium batteries? You know, I... I mean, is that where this is going, you think? There... I think they fulfill kind of different needs. And, you know, again, if you look at, um, I believe one of the earlier slides where I, I talk about the, here we go, the, you know, the technology, if you're looking at duration versus um, yeah. uh, energy, um, you know, this technology, I think will be good for, for long duration type things. Um, you know, if you're looking for a really quick response or something in a shorter term, Maybe some of these other technologies might be a, a solution there. You can see form isn't really circling that that short duration area. So I guess my answer would be um, okay. different applications for different needs. This is an interesting slide, really, to study. <laughs> yeah, yes. Cole, does the like cost per megawatt, for example, is it how does it compare to the other technologies? You know, I I don't have much to report on yet. We haven't finished construction or, or done anything yet. So the best the best I can share at the moment is the kind of the generalized graph here um, to, to kind of give an idea of where we hope it lands and where we where we foresee it landing. But obviously as the technology matures and we see more deployments in larger scales, I think we'll get a better idea of where those costs are landing. Yeah. I was wondering also on this uh on this graph, have has form um, actually explored all of these other um, storage technologies um, or just read about them, you know, researched and them, but I have that, I was wondering if they'd actually experimented with them. I, I, I can't speak to that, unfortunately. I know they have a number of people um, that come from, you know, similar type companies that might have done lithium ion technology or, you know, EVs or solar. So, um, it's possible they had experience with it, but I don't know for certain if form, you know, got this from research they did, or if it's something they've they've worked with themselves. But this graph was created by form. Correct. Okay. Oh, okay, uh, we got we got a question a, from Pete. Go ahead, Pete. Um, I'm noticing the um, the um. 35 to 38 percent round trip efficiency including power electronics which are usually at least in the 90s efficient 
So there's a fair bit of heat from the batteries that need to be dissipated. So my question is, what temperature do the battery, batteries prefer to operate at? Perhaps it's above room temperature so that um, dissipating this heat of cycling is um, not costly. Do you know what the preferred temperature is for these batteries? You know, they list an operating temperature on the table. Um, the the round trip efficiency is uh, on the low end. And, you know, it, I think there's there's opportunities for them to increase it, but it becomes a matter of economics where they're targeting low cost, long duration. And, you know, a trade off there is maybe it's not as efficient. They could increase efficiency, but now you might be looking at a higher installed cost and they're trying their best to balance that. Um, but in, in, in response to your question about where those losses materialize, if it's heat, I, I, I don't know. Um, this is what they've been working on internally, but the operating temperature that they prefer, you can see listed there is, they, they get a, the range of minus 40 to 50 C. So, Okay, well, if the temperature of minus 50, of, uh, plus 50 C, even in the summer, costly air conditioning would not be needed then. It would just need uh, substantial ventilation, which is a lot less expensive than cooling. So that's good. Well, David, go, go ahead, David. A couple of things. Um, uh, the 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 observation about um, um, about the need for air conditioning, heat cooling. These are really meant for outdoor installations, correct? Yes, the, our okay. our pilot will be deployed um, sort of out on a. Like I showed the the kind of grassy field hill, so they they won't right, be within right. a building or anything. And and these are really all are only meant from fixed in place. In other words, this isn't isn't a, any sort of a substitute. Uh, putting aside all the other performance issues, uh, it's mainly fixed in place because because of weight, isn't it? I mean, iron's really heavy. I would imagine. I don't know what one of these what what one of these containers weighs. Um, we haven't done the civil. We haven't finalized civil design yet to know, but. Uh, um, I don't, I don't believe they are meant to be moved around much once they are deployed. Right. Which makes it, a, you know, a perfect, uh, supplement to, uh, solar and, and wind, um, uh, installations, um, you know, to, to, uh, to store the excess energy when, um, uh, when the grid isn't ready to take it. That that's what, yep. That's what form it's is really, definitely. So these, these are really, these are really to replace peaker plants. Yeah, like, like I said, you know, looking at the decarbonization goals, that's where forms really trying to, you know, I, I don't think it's a mistake that they did put solar and, and wind on the on the graphic here where they've deployed the large scale project. So, um, again, we're 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 trying to look at any solution we can to help solve the, the you know, intermittency of resources and then also just those those times of need where we don't have generation available. Yeah, that makes sense. Graham, go ahead. Yes, I'm wondering about maintenance in terms of does the uh, aqueous solution have any special chemistry in it that requires special handling and um, uh, and, and 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 highly related to it? I think I saw like a thousand. You expect a thousand cycles out of this, and then can it be? Uh, can you just then regenerate uh, all the parts of it, or how's that all work out? Those are fantastic questions. We we hope to answer with our <laughs> pilot project. Um, I we we had that I believe asked at uh, at the Mipsicon conference last year where Form attended, and you know the answer right now is we don't know. Um, it's definitely something we want to look at. That's why we wanted to start on the smaller side to get a good feel for it. But we are we are cognizant of it. It's something we want to learn and partner with Form on and. You know, hopefully in a couple of years, um, maybe we can come back and share some of the findings with you all. Yeah, that would be great. Do you, uh, Cole, you know, the picture we're looking at, it's got all the modules. Does, does the actual physical size of what you guys are going to be putting in, is it about the size of two modules or more? Um, It's about... It, it it'll it'll be roughly reminiscent of what you see on on this power block size. You know they they show this as a three point five megawatt. Ours is going to be one point five megawatt. So maybe you know several containers less than what you see here, but you know roughly this footprint. And you can I think see two two people there kind of standing. Okay. So. 
is is it, 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 you know, I was just thinking I was at the uh, storage site for Conexus, and uh, so these look like they could be about the size of those units that they're using for storage. Yeah. I, don't, I don't I don't know if you've seen those, but um, no, but. Um, yeah, I think for, for, forms targeting that that two to three megawatts per acre. So um, our our pilot's about one acre in size that we'll be deploying this. So okay, Pete, another question? Uh, yes, the um, there are several batteries that have been um, developed in recent decades for stationary use, and I'm wondering if um, GRE um, specifically researched other um, storage options. Um, perhaps sodium sulfur, or was this more motivated by by the form company approaching you guys? And uh, and I, I am just curious as to the depth of the research you guys did in uh, available alternatives. Yeah, you know we 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 haven't physically tested with any other any other products yet. We we do our research and we do partner with institutions such as EPRI to have them try to educate us on what's available out there and the advances in the field. Um, it just so happened that the first technology we selected was was form. So, um, you know, we, we identify the need for storage. This was something that to our leadership looked like a really viable solution and something they were excited to to prototype and test and share with our membership. So, um, you know, who's to say we don't try something else here in the coming years as well but uh at this time it's just form so okay yeah and in the future who is to say what we're going to do for storing energy that's going to be a tremendous area of growth in the next 50 years yeah. right yep the, uh, hope so. the, the thing that kind of impressed me after the, by the time cole and i hooked up was the announcement came out that uh xl was going to do you know 10 megawatts and 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 other you just Cole just mentioned another company is doing 15 and uh so it, it it appears that it's 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 been researched out by you know some big companies that really are are going to take a, a bigger slice of it and try it the same D Doug they're they're both they're all using this form technology yeah really yeah go, go uh Cole can you go back to the slide with who I was trying to think who's the other company that was going to, Oh, Georgia power. Oh, wow. Georgia power is a huge operation. And I, uh, I believe there's been even more announced since this slide deck. I, it, the name escapes me, but I know if you go to forms, press releases, they, they've announced some other uh, partnerships with, with large utilities. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, this, this is very exciting. Any other questions? Any, any, Ella, did you see anything in chat that we need to cover? Well, Doug, something that I thought was interesting is that this battery has much more life than pumped hydro, and I never would have expected that. Much more what, Mark? Duration. Oh, duration. Okay, yeah, life. Okay. Yeah, it 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 looks like. A really exciting breakthrough and you know i mean we can only hope that it's going to perform the way everybody, everybody's projecting but yeah. like i like i say when i when i saw xl and and now i see georgia power also doing it that that tells me that you know it it looks like it's darn good and people are willing to you know buy into it so uh call question here uh lewis asher uh, do you think that this the uh, battery approach might someday work in computers, or is it just too heavy or too big? Any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. We're, uh, I, I'll, I'll only claim my area of knowledge in the utility space. So, um, but I guess anything's possible. Maybe cloud computing. Ah. <laughs> uh, Great presentation. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. Tim, Tim, go ahead, please. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, assuming this test goes really well and you say, my God, this is viable, how many of these do you want? Uh, how uh, how big is this going to get for Great River Energy? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. We 
uh, you know, in an earlier slide, I said in our in our re integrated resource plan out in 2037, um, I think we've identified that we would need about 3.5% of our overall capacity to be provided by storage. I believe that's about 200 megawatts, um, but, you know, quite a bit larger than our 1.5 megawatts that we have here. So uh, we definitely have a future. And, you know, you can see a quote actually from our vice president, John Brecky, uh, talking about that. Um, we definitely are excited to partner with them. And it's it's definitely going to be a part of our future moving forward. Uh, I have one more question. Um, what's the proximity? Um, I saw in the creative uh, concept slide, you know, where they had all the all the wind generators um, all around the storage. Um, I wondering how close how close does the storage need to be to the source of production? Um, I, I'm I would say that that likely depends on the specific installation, but I mean, really, if you're able to locate a battery anywhere there's a transmission line, assuming you have the right permitting, um, I think form is looking at these to be deployed at a, you know, at a utility scale, really anywhere in the system that they're needed. So, um, you know, potentially in areas where there is no generation uh, might be a, a good place to actually site a storage project like this, so. Right. Paul, as far as transmission lines, um, what do you think the future is going to be about those? Also, I think there's some companies, I, I know 3M used to, I don't know if they still do have uh, lines that can take twice as much uh, electricity through them. Uh, anything like that going to be used or what's your knowledge in that area? Uh, I'm def I'm definitely more on the generation power supply side, but I, you know, the, the comments I, I made earlier in, in um, MISO's LRTP, their long range transmission planning, um, transmission is going to be a, a, a big part of our grid moving forward. Um, the Northern Reliability Project, there's, there's, I think, $10 billion of investment uh, in this first phase of the build out. So um, there's, there's going to be a lot of transmission in the future. Um, in addition to probably technologies like this, so. Yeah, I think they're talking about, isn't it like five major projects coming up in the near future with transmission? Yeah. And that's that's just the first, they call them tranches. Um, yep. as, they, yep. as they look at future tranches, it's even more. So there'll be a lot of transmission build out in the next decade. Yeah, it's going to be interesting on the... Uh, not in my backyard routine with how that goes. So at least at least it seems to be going better in general than it did years ago when they first started doing it. And I mean, all you to me, all you gotta do is drive from Albert Lee to Sioux Falls and you feel like you're in a transmission <laughs> corridor. Right. There's just so many powers there. Do you, Nicole, just kind of a different question. So do you guys see any other technologies that, I mean, you're, you're going to move to renewables and, you know, you're, you're downsizing coal. Um, oh, let me ask you, what, can you tell us a little bit about the Rainbow Project up in North Dakota and what that, what that means to GRE? Yeah, that was primarily, we, we had a, a coal plant uh coal creek in underwood north dakota that uh gre has since sold to a company known as rainbow energy so um gre no longer owns that plant and uh we we actually uh purchased power from them through a contract that uh we we are kind of transition away throughout the years so again looking at some of those slides um you can see as we were coal we we move away from that um again, based on our, our mandates and our member requests on our portfolio changes. Speaking of transmission lines, so the big line between Coal Creek and GRE, is that GRE's line or, or Rainbow's or? Uh, that, that high voltage DC line? Yeah. Yep, that was, that was also uh, sold as a part of that um, 
sales. So that I believe is owned by a company called uh, Nexus. Uh, it's a related company to Rainbow. So okay, because at one point I heard one reason that went down the way it did is the fact that a lot of wind energy could now be put on that line and uh you know hopefully encourage more renewables from wind that's out in the you know the prairies out there and everything but uh i i wonder if that line will have capacity to take any more than it's, it's going to be supplying already you know yeah i was just driving out in jamestown north dakota and i thought my car was going to blow over from the wind so there's <laughs> definitely a prevalence of that resource in north dakota yeah oh my gosh it's just such a wonderful resource that you know we should be trying to take more advantage of you know you mentioned MISO and I think one of your people and you would probably know this one of your people told me that you guys have to project your load needs like is 24 hours ahead of time or something like that with MISO could you virtually supply power to them and then buy it back from them is that right um I'm a little out of my element on this one, but yeah, every, <laughs> every everything we produce goes into MISO and everything that we would uh, procure for our member distribution member owners also comes out of MISO. So okay, yeah, basically the marketplace for energy. Yep, and that's that's with all the I mean, XL and everybody else still all feed into that, right? Correct. And, and as far as hydro or anything, you don't see any big changes with GRE, with, with hydro. And I see you had that one section that went up into Canada. Did that have anything to do with hydro up from up there? Um, I'm going to go back and see what we had for our projections. Uh, yeah, Manitoba Hydro, I believe, Yeah, is a large part. And... Yeah, so you know, in in twenty twenty seven, I th I think we have hydroelectric representing six percent of our energy supply. So, um, definitely a future with hydro. Yeah, that's good. Of course, sometimes that's considered renewable, and then sometimes some people say it's not. So, <laughs> right. I guess as long as it's flowing water, it can be counted. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, any other questions of Cole? We we got the the man here, and and this has been very interesting. I I just think you know, it it to me it's just so exciting that a whole different technology that, I mean, everybody was so much into you know lithium and all that type of thing, and and now there's this whole new technology that seems much much cleaner for the environment and and. Uh, when you guys buy a project like this and you say it's got a 20 year life cycle, do you uh, calculate in like cost for, you know, replacing it in the future or does that not come into play until down the line? You know, in, in this case, that 20 year uh, projection or life expectancy is something form has come up with. So I, I can't comment much on that, but um this is a, a pilot project, so um, I think we're we're really looking to use it as a, a learning platform. Um, and I'm sure Form will be interested in the long term uh, sort of condition and how everything operates as we get through it. So I don't I don't think we've made a decision on that yet, but uh, um, I guess time will tell. Right. Okay. David, <laughs> go ahead, David. Oh. Yeah, uh, in the graphic that you have up there right now, you have 24% of your supply coming from Rainbow Purchase in 2027. What's their mix? Yeah. That that was their their Rainbow is the uh, Coal Creek plant that we had sold. So that's through a market uh, sort of procurement. And as as we move further into future, that that percentage decreases. So are they all coal? Yes. Yes. Okay. They, I, they are, I believe, looking at other solutions, but uh, I, I think the the one I pulled out from our IRP or our, our website is that you know we're projecting to be ninety percent carbon free in our portfolio by twenty thirty five. 
the graph is a little misleading then the the color should be blue <laughs> yes it should you know it's kind of weird yeah i absolutely agree i this, there's there's a serious issue of greenwashing out there and you, you don't want to be caught in that right the one the one thing that i've heard though it's rainbow and you know who knows how this is going to work out but their one of their big selling points was that they're going to do carbon capture and they're they're feeling like they can do it and they've got a place in north dakota to store it and so you know i guess we'll all see how how that works but there okay. you know there, there are some successful areas where they are doing carbon capture so but with a name like rainbow purchase it makes it seem like there are a variety of uh you know real you know diverse portfolio or something but they should have just kept coal creek you know <laughs> uh, i want to thank you cole for bringing up uh climate change uh unfortunately in this country we have a percentage of the population that doesn't even believe it and the fact that you're bringing it up makes a big difference yeah. uh, my generation has made has messed up the whole situation and uh, i'm retired i'm older obviously and i appreciate and i apologize to your generation for what we've done quite frankly and people before us so i really do appreciate this uh one thing that i learned more than anything else in my career is that necessity is the mother of invention if we don't feel a necessity we just keep burning coal and gas and so on and so forth and now we're feeling the, the, the pressure of doing some changes. And so when you brought up climate change, I really respected that. And you've done a great job tonight. So God bless you and thank you very much. Thank you. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I, I noticed on your slide showing the different energy options, you had hydrogen as an option. And I think that was actually storing the gas itself. I'm wondering if ammonia storage has been looked at because uh, I heard Michael Reese from the University of Minnesota Morris, and he's saying that uh, ammonia storage uh, for producing electricity would be more efficient than anything uh, used so far. Not more efficient, more cost effective. I yeah, I can't unfortunately okay. speak to that. We we haven't looked at ammonia um, aside from maybe some preliminary research, but uh, yeah, there's it. it there are so many storage technologies sort of bubbling up um, that you've got a lot of companies coming in and, you know, claiming to be the solution. So um, that's really where I think, you know, we with Form and others just want to find a viable solution that we think will, will work in the long term for our members. Ammonia is really dangerous to store. If it gets out, you have a bow pile on your hands. They're, ta they're talking about using some of the big storage tanks that you use for ag out in western Minnesota to store some of that ammonia. And uh, I know Mike Reese out there has been promoting that for a couple of years now. I, I personally want, wouldn't want to live near an ammonia storage facility, <laughs> or at least not downwind from one. Yeah, or, 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 you know, or some of that other nuclear stuff. <laughs> There you go. Probably safer than a hydrogen storage facility. Yeah, yeah. Correct. <laughs> well, Cole, if there's uh, anything else you'd, you'd like to, you know, finish it off with, we appreciate so much you doing this and taking our questions. Hopefully we didn't, you know, hit you in too many places that uh, you guys haven't talked about yet, but and you, I'm sure you have, but it uh, has been fascinating, you know, and I mean, this this particular slide that you're showing right now, I really, really like that. You know, it, it yeah, really. Too. Oh, it, Doug, I, I also want to ask, um, Cole, is the Inflation Reduction Act helping fund some of this stuff? It's something we're looking at. You know, I think the government is looking at technologies or solutions like this. Um, I think there's a lot of nuance that we're trying our best to understand with with uh, government requirements and, and the like. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's definitely what they're targeting with a lot of the, the funding that's being uh, uh, offered by the government. So we're looking at it. Good. I personally think this line should be at our wind turbine display at the state fair. Just 
here you've got the compressed air down here. You know, so it does show that we are showing something that is viable, but it's showing also that there's something in the future that's coming that's much, much better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, Cole, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, we'll uh, hopefully get you back later on after you guys get operational and and uh, you, you can share some more of your experiences with us. So. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you for having me tonight. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, you bet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cole. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Cole. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.